Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome um, in the name of the Leo Beck Institute to the first LBI London Summer Lecture. My name is Kinga Bloch, and I'm the Deputy Director of the LBI London, and it is my great pleasure to announce um, John Hillary tonight, who will talk about German Jews, English gentry, the Messel family, and the cultural expression of a changing identity. Um, just a few short words about the structure of tonight's event, because thanks to the blessings of modern technology and the tech wizards at the German Historical Institute and the Leo Beck Institute, we can offer our lecture tonight to a hybrid audience. You will be able to participate in the Q&A following the lecture, both online and in the room, which is um, quite an achievement, I find. And I promise I will explain how to join the conversation about John Hillary's fascinating talk from the Zoom space after the lecture. Tonight's lecture is supported by both the German Historical Institute and the Jewish Country Houses Project at Oxford University. And I would like to thank both institutions for their help in the organization and the promotion of this event. Before I go into greater detail about the lecture and our speaker, I would like to hand over the baton to Chris Professor Christina von Hodenberg, the director of the German Historical Institute that is so kind to host us tonight. Thank you so much, Kinga. Um, a warm welcome on behalf of the German Historical Institute. It is really um, our pleasure and we are delighted that we have this long-standing partnership with the Leo Beck Institute London, which brings German Jewish history and European Jewish history to the German Historical Institute on a regular basis. And I'm delighted that we have John Hillary today, uh, today and I'm looking forward to the topic. Um, please, um, feel as welcome as, 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 as you can. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Kinga. I'm looking forward to our discussions and of course, to John's lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Christina. I can, I can only um, give that back. We're particularly indebted to the GHI that has been one of the most longstanding partners of the Leo Beck Institute London in both our academic and public events. Um, and as you all know, Christina and the entire team at the GHI, it's always a great pleasure to um, be here and to collaborate with you and your wonderful team. Thank you. Um, let me now very briefly introduce our speaker, John Hillary, um, who is an author and was made honorary professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham in 2013. John Hillary has published widely on global trade and other international issues over the past 20 years. His current research, however, concentrates on the history of German Jewish immigration to Britain in the 19th century, focusing on the ways German Jewish families navigated their home from a cultural and from an artistic point of view. He's affiliated with the Oxford University's Jewish Country Houses project and has written this wonderful volume, let me just show it here, um, about the Messel family of Nylons that is titled From Refugees to Royalty, The Remarkable Story of the Messel Family of Nymans. The book was published by Peter Owen Publishers in spring 2021, and I could indeed spend a very long time talking about this book and the impressive contributions the members of the Messel family have made to the fields of architecture, horticulture, photography, costume design, and of course, also to the collection. Of art. Evidently, we'd all rather listen to John Hillary himself, so we're quite lucky to have him here tonight. Um, and it is quite interesting, and I was quite thrilled to hear that he's currently researching the fine art collections of German Jewish migrants in the Victorian and Edwardian era, and has co edited a special issue of the Journal of the History of Collections on that theme with Tom Stammers. And the latter was published in 2022. This volume presents a wide range of case studies on expatriate German Jewish collections in the fin de siècle Europe. And John Hillary and Tom Stammers quite clearly state in their introduction, um, titled Bildung Beyond Borders, German Jewish Collectors Outside Germany between 1870 and 1940, how these collectors, and please forgive me for this lax expression, exported Bildung abroad. <laughs> 
And by Bildung, I mean, and here I quote, the German concept of personal self-cultivation through the lifelong development of one's intellectual, aesthetic, and spiritual sensibilities. John Hillary's contribution to this volume, Creating a Palace of Art, the lost collection of Leopold and Mathilde Hirsch, is a very interesting case in point for ways Bildung traveled across borders. It reconstructs the Hirsch family's carefully created collection of paintings and art objects and their sophisticated personal involvement in the art market. So I'm very, very much looking forward to John's lecture tonight and to learn more about how we can use art and the objects one owns and cherishes to broaden our historical understanding of German Jewish families in transition from, Germans, from the German speaking cultural space to British society in the 19th and early 20th century. And as promised, I was briefed on, so the audience is all yours and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much, um, Kinga. Thank you so much, Christina, for the invitation and good evening to everybody. I'm delighted to be able to deliver this lecture here before the Leo Beck Institute and at the German Historical Institute in London, because it was 35 years ago in 1988 that those two institutions were the first sponsors of a pioneering conference in Cambridge, looking across the whole board of the German Jewish contribution to life in Britain. And from that conference came this fantastic volume called Second Chance, which documents the contribution of German Jews in so many fields, both from the 19th into the 20th century. And the book really remains an astonishing resource for anybody doing research into that area today. Since that time, I think it's fair to say that the majority of the focus of researchers has been on the immense contribution made by refugees, German Jewish refugees coming to Britain in the 1930s, fleeing the Nazis. And my research has been a little bit more on the other side, perhaps the Cinderella side of the, of the equation, looking at the late Victorian and Edwardian German Jewish refugees who came over here. And um, as ah, it's not going up and down, that's not so good. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, so yes, the, 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 the research that I've done has been twofold, really. Um, looking in depth at the Messel family, which is, as King has so generously said, the subject of my book, and also happens to be my mother's family. So I was able to go in depth into some of the unpublished archives there. But then also looking more broadly across a whole range of different German Jewish families, and particularly their cultural expression of this changing identity that they had. And, and I want to say it's not just about the changing identity of the individual families themselves that I'm talking about, it's about the changing identity of what it meant to be German Jewish itself, which of course was in great flux throughout the 19th into the 20th century, and that those two things are completely interconnected because the families themselves are examples who then took forward that development as we shall see as we go through. I'm going to start with an overview map of, of Germany as it is today, just to give a sense of the trajectory of the Messel family. And they started, if you look at the northwest up on the Dutch border in Lower Saxony in the county of Bentheim. The Messel family was expelled from its original home in the county of Bentheim in 1763 by a Jewish decree and a Juden Ordnung, which said that all Jewish families had to leave within six weeks. And they traveled down south to the Grand Duchy of Hesse and found refuge in the village of Messel, which you can see there just to the northeast of Darmstadt underneath Frankfurt. And the Grand Duchy of Hesse was known as a much more welcoming environment for Jews at that time. And the supreme irony of the Messel story, which is what I tried to encapsulate in the title of the book, From Refugees to Royalty, 
is that they were made into refugees. They were expelled by this Judenordnung um, under the, the signature of George III, who was Elector of Hanover at the time and controlling the county. Four generations and 200 years later, the story comes full circle when the youngest member of the Messel family, Tony Armstrong Jones, marries into that same British royal family which expelled them back in 1763. And that is the sort of the, the book ending, if you want, of the story which I'm going to tell. They found refuge in the village of Messel, a very pretty village in the South Hessian countryside. You can see here, um, there's quite a few of the 18th and 17th century timber framed houses which still survive there. But more important for our purposes, Messel had a thriving Jewish community at that time. In fact, by the end of the 18th century, one in six households in the village were Jewish. And in the census, which was taken at the beginning of the 19th century, 12, 13% of the population was Jewish then, which is 10 times plus more than the average across the Germanic states at the time. And they were sufficiently confident that they were one of the first village communities to have asked permission to build their own synagogue, 1739 already, they had the first synagogue in Messel. Um, if, if you read German, you'll be able to see there that it's now been pulled down since then. But this, um, this, this um, sign remains. And the Messel family were very successful within the Jewish community, they were successful within the environment and the economy of the time, and were able to move from Messel at the beginning of the 19th century into the big city, into Darmstadt itself, which was going through a boom at that time. It was really turning from an old medieval town with a few hundred houses all sort of cramped up around the central Schloss into a modern industrial city in the Industrial Revolution. And so the first visual evidence we have of the Messel family is this photograph from the beginning of the 1830s showing Aaron Messel on the right and his wife Carolina, Caroline Messel on the left. She originally came from the Stern um, family of, of Frankfurt, quite well known as banking family in the 18th century. And I think what's fascinating about this first portrayal of the Messels, even in that relatively early period in the 19th century, is how they are presenting themselves in this picture. They're presenting themselves really quintessentially as Germans rather than necessarily as Jewish. If you look at Aaron, he is he's clean shaven, wearing a three piece suit, a wing collar and a cravat. And in fact, you know, there's a joke in the family that the only thing really that shows him as being Jewish is his dark eyes and his curly dark hair, which was passed down to many members of the Messel family. I've still got the dark eyes, but nature has decreed that my hair is no longer quite as dark as it was. Um, but you also look at Caroline wearing this very neat dress and a Biedermeyer bonnet, very much in the German style of the period. And this reminds us that for German Jews in the 19th century, that the, the idea of becoming emancipated was not like it was in France, where it was held to be a right which you were born into as a French citizen. In Germany, emancipation was seen as a reward, a reward for your acculturation, your becoming German. And this is really where I think that the, the distinction begins to come and also where you begin to see the roots of German Jewish desires to become fully German in as many may, ways as they can. And the Messel family was very successful. Um, the Aaron Messel Bank House was founded in Ludwigsplatz. This is a picture of Ludwigsplatz from the 1830s, right in the center of the new development of Darmstadt. And you can see the banking house is the rather nice looking neoclassical building on the right of the picture. And it showed that they were a very modern Jewish family providing finance for this new wave of industrial um, development in Darmstadt at the time. But perhaps the, the clearest indication of how they were becoming more and more German 
while remaining still Jewish, comes when you go and visit the Jewish cemetery in Darmstadt. Like other Jewish cemeteries in Germany, it's a very moving place. Um, and you can see here the oldest part of the cemetery with the tombs of a fairly regular form, this tabernacle form with all of the inscriptions in Hebrew. Fast forward to Caroline and Aaron Messel's tomb. It's one of the very first to have a, a non-traditional form, this neo-Romanesque form to it. And it's one of the very first tombs where the inscription is entirely in German with no Hebrew at all. And again, this is showing them not just as modern Germans, but it's actually also showing that they've shifted the whole concept of German Jewry at this time. So instead of being seen as Jews who happen to live in Germany, they're now being seen as German citizens of the Jewish persuasion. So Deutsche Staatsbürger jüdischen Glaubens, as the, as the phrase become known throughout the, the 19th century. And um, the key to this shift is really in the education system. And this is the school in Darmstadt, the oldest Lutheran school, the pedagogue, where all of the Messel's sons were educated. Instead of two generations before, when they would all have gone into separate Jewish schools and had a predominantly religious education, they were now pushed through the system in a new humanist education, which foregrounded the importance of Bildung, as Kinga was explaining at the beginning building this idea of not just an academic education, but the self-cultivation of a much broader set of abilities. Intellectual, yes, but also cultural, spiritual, all the sensibilities which would make up what perhaps in other circumstances one would call a Renaissance man. And I'm particularly um, grateful in this to Simone Lessig's work, um, looking at the transfer of economic capital into social capital via cultural capital. And I say this particularly because Simone Lessig is, of course, the director of the um, Washington branch of the German Historical Institute. And her book, Jüdische Wege ins Bürgertum, is really fantastic in explaining how this transformation was made. Because what it says is that German Jews were not just integrating into German society generally, they were integrating into German society at the highest level, the Bildungsbürgertum, the intellectual and cultural elite. And that I think is, is critical for the trajectory of the Messel family and the others coming after. And there's no better example, I think, of this than Alfred Messel, who was the only one of the siblings who stayed in Germany um, when the others came over to Britain. Alfred Messel became one of the most celebrated architects in Germany of the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. Many of his designs, his buildings still survive in Berlin. This is one of his social reform projects, a housing block in the Proskauer Straße in the east of Berlin, um, which was which internationally acclaimed at the time. It won the gold medal at the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900. And he had many other private commissions at the time, but he was increasingly frustrated that he was passed over for some of the most important public commissions in Berlin, maybe as a result of the, the lingering Prussian distrust of Jewish modernism. And he had to go back to Darmstadt, his, his native town, um, for his first major public commission, which was the Hessisches Landesmuseum, the State Museum of Hesse, which still survived. This is the, 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 the design drawing that he brought out in the 1890s. And you can see from how it looks today that it's very much the same museum. And in fact, it's just gone through a magnificent seven year rehabilitation. And if you ever find yourself um, in the West of Germany, I, I thoroughly recommend that you drop in on it. And um, he moved back to Berlin and really perhaps the, the commission for which he was most well known was the development of the Wertheim department store right in the center 
of Berlin. It's on the Leipziger Straße, and you can see it here as he had developed it. And the concept of the department store in the 1880s and 1890s was something relatively new in Germany. It had already been developed in France and in, in the USA as a new form of shopping, but it was brought in to Germany and the Wertheim department store really was the iconic model in the German context. It had enormous great atriums inside that the square footage was twice that of the Reichstag Parliament building up, up the road. It had these three grand atriums with their own sculpture, and it had that feel very much of a religious experience where shopping was elevated to something which was much more holy and, and, and sacred in its, in its connotations. And it also became a great social center. People would just say, we're popping off to Wertheim, wir gehen zu Wertheim became a, an expression for people to use if they were just popping off to meet friends for a coffee, a little bit like it would happen today. But while in France and in America, and indeed here in London with Harrods and Selfridges, this was just considered to be a new form of shopping. In Germany, it was considered to be an existential threat to the traditional German values of decency, quality, hard work, and fair play, because it was expected that these enormous shops would be selling mass-produced goods of low quality, stacked up and sold off cheap, and perhaps also with the exploitation of their workforces. But worse still, at a period where the rise of political anti-Semitism was really beginning to gain ground. All of the main department stores in Germany at the time were owned and run by Jews. And this is quite a famous um, cartoon from the 1890s showing exactly this contradiction, this, this tension between the small um, German shopkeeper on the left, who's come into the department store and he's saying to the Jewish proprietor, um, you've completely ruined me as a result of all this unfair competition, and there's nothing left for me to do but to put a bullet through my brains. And in the dark humor of the satirical magazine, Simplicissimus, which this comes from, the Jewish proprietor responds by saying, if I might be of assistance, sir, the firearms department is on the first floor. Now, you may think that this is this a bit of dark humor with a lot of anti-Semitic overtones. It's important to point out that it was um, created, the cartoonist was um, Thomas Heiner, himself a German Jewish um, proprietor of, of the magazine who'd founded it himself. So it shows that these tensions were very well understood at the time. But interestingly, the resolution of this contradiction between the traditional and the modern, the German and the Jewish, really came through two German Jews, because it was in the extension of the Wertheim department store onto the Leipziger Platz, so right in the middle of Berlin, that you saw the resolution of, of the contradictions. And of course, Georg Wertheim, he was the German Jewish proprietor, Alfred Messel, was the German Jewish architect who put this in. And, and the resolution comes because if you look at that facade as it looked out onto Leipziger Platz, it is revolutionary in its modernism, very austere in its lines. It has no superfluous advertising. It's a very confident building. Um, even the shop windows are hidden behind those very deep arcades which support the facade. But at the same time, it evokes very clearly the traditions of German Gothic. And this very strong vertical lines immediately spoke to the German people of their own tradition, particularly in the ecclesiastical architecture. And if you look at the Wertheim building from exactly the same angle after the Second World War, when it had been bombed out and just before it was going to be demolished, you could actually mistake it for a ruined Gothic cathedral if you didn't know where it had come from. The irony, therefore, is that this, this resolution was made by two German Jews. The added irony is that, in fact, Alfred Messel had just been baptized into the Protestant faith, which again shows the tensions and the identity of German Jews at the time. <clears throat> 
And the success of the Wertheim extension led to Alfred Messel's final great commission, which is when the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, appointed him as the architect of the Royal Museums and gave him the commission to build the Pergamon Museum, which was the final piece of the jigsaw of the new Berlin Museum Island, which sought to position the new unified German state over and against France with, with Paris, Britain with London, and even the Austro-Hungarian Empire with Vienna. And it was a fascinating shift because the Kaiser himself became very close to Alfred Messel. Alfred Messel was seen as the architect to the Kaiser. He was an arbiter of taste for the Kaiser. And this completely overturned an earlier suspicion. The Kaiser had rejected him for this post saying he was a hypermodernist. And Alfred Messel's great friend, the architect Ludwig Hoffmann, wrote him this lovely letter in which he said, Alfred, we haben sich die Zeiten verändert. How times have changed. But while Alfred Messel was perhaps navigating the dual identity of being German and Jewish, his elder brother Ludwig Messel had come over to Britain in 1865. And this was the moment when the, the Messels began their trajectory from being German Jews to becoming English gentry. In 1869, so just four years after he arrived, he applied for British nationality, was made therefore a British subject of Queen Victoria. And here's an interesting mix of identities throughout his life. His first position in terms of his, his career was with the German Jewish banking firm Seligman Brothers. And indeed his sister Lena married Isaac Seligman um, just shortly after that, when he founded his own firm, a stockbroking firm of L. Messel and Co. He was predominantly involved with other Jewish bankers and stockbrokers at the time, and he became one of the early members of the Anglo Jewish Association. The family home also was set up in the area of Tyburnia, the area just north of Hyde Park. And you can see here um, Westbourne Terrace, the main axis of that area of Tyburnia. The Messel House was one of those grand stuccoed houses on the left. But this was, as well as a very grand area, it was a cosmopolitan area. There were lots of Greeks, of Germans, of French inhabitants, and indeed, increasingly, lots of Jewish inhabitants. So the Messels could feel somewhat at home here at the same time. But he married Annie Messel, um, originally Annie Cussons, from an English Christian background. And again, this mix of identity is rather nicely shown here in this gorgeous portrait of her by Solomon J. Solomon, the second um, Jewish artist to become a full member of the Royal Academy here in Britain. And they had six children, all of whom were baptized into the Church of England. He sent both his sons to Eton. The daughters were married off one after the other to English and Christian families. So you can begin to see that level of integration. And it was integration, again, not just into British society, but at a particular level. And the particular level was again established through the art collection, the cultural presence and the cultural persona, which Ludwig managed to convey. And he, he I won't show you many of the pieces from his collection, but to give you an example, this wonderful portrait by Angelica Kaufmann which is now in the Princeton University Art Museum, was one of his first purchases. It's a very large work, which Princeton suggests is perhaps um, Angelica Kaufman's masterpiece in portraiture. He also bought a very large work by Sir Joshua Reynolds, again, and interestingly on a Christian theme, um, The Holy Family with the Infant St. John, of which there's also a copy in the Tate. And he became very interested in collecting Renaissance Maiolica, um, also blue and white porcelain, so that when you went to their house in Westbourne Terrace, it was really a fantastic treasure house of art. And again, this, I think, draws out two of the advantages, perhaps, the German Jews coming over to Britain had at that time. On the one hand, it actually was in their interest, to their advantage, that they were foreigners, 
because you could immediately see they didn't fit into the rigid British class system. They were considered to be something different. And when they could present themselves on the second aspect as being very highly cultured, they could actually slot in at that higher level. And this expression of their Bildung, their cultural sophistication through art collections is very much what I've been researching in the other, in the other families that I've been looking at. But the decisive move really into English gentry came with the acquisition of the country estate of Nyman's in 1890. And this was a statement of intent. If you think as a German Jewish family coming into Britain, this was saying we're not just temporary residents here, we're setting down our roots and we're claiming a permanence of tenure a security of tenure, which had actually often been denied in the German context, where it had been unclear um, for, for most of the 19th century to what extent German Jews could actually own property at all. But when Ludwig and Annie Messel moved in to Neumanns, even though it was quite a nice large regency, regency property, they immediately felt they wanted to extend it. And this again shows quite interestingly the, the, the conflict in the identities which Ludwig brought. Because the first design that he had for the extension of Nyman's came from the British architect Leonard Stokes. And he reimagined the front of Nyman's as a neo Jacobean, very English looking building. And this was never realized. We don't know whether it was because Ludwig rejected such a statement of identity or whether he just fell out with Leonard Stokes, who was known to be a particularly difficult, cantankerous architect. Instead, Ludwig Messel turned back to his brother, Alfred, the architect in Berlin, and he said that he particularly wanted to have an extension to the house which was in the continental form. And as you can see, this design, which Alfred prepared for him in the 1890s, is fundamentally Germanic in its identity. It's got that very Renaissance tower with a high, steeply pitched roof surmounted by a hexagonal lantern on top, which is familiar from a lot of German um, architectural designs. And then this extraordinary Alpine chalet which is blocked on the front and extended onto the lawn at Nyman's. And when this was built, even though there were sort of modifications in the realization of it, you can see that it had quite a strange effect, what had been quite a neat um, uh, Regency um, villa before that. And particularly, one of the problems in having what seemed to be a very Germanic design is when it came to the First World War. Because, of course, as tensions rose between Germany and Britain coming into the early years of the 20th century, it became more and more difficult for German Jews who'd settled, and Germans of any sort, who'd settled in Britain, because their identity was actually split between their native and their adopted countries. And that viewing platform that you see, the Belvedere, which is in the tower, um, was then suddenly seen in a much more sinister light by the locals who thought this could actually be a spy platform from which the Messels were looking at their neighbours and then feeding information back to Berlin. Exactly what they were going to see in rural Sussex um, is unclear and how that would be of any interest to the Berlin authorities. But you can see the sort of rising feeling against the Germans in, for example, the anti-German union and these posters which were put around at the time. And it made it incredibly stressful for German Jews, Germans of any sort, who had taken on British nationality but still were living in Britain at that time. Ludwig Messel had by this time 16 English grandchildren. He'd been in England for over 50 years. And this, this conflict between his adopted nation and his native country um, was too much for him to bear. And so he died in 1915. The tradition within the families, he died of a broken heart. And there are many similar stories um, from other families, but it was made all the more tragic um, because on the other side of the family, Alfred Messel's only son died on the Western Front fighting for the German army against his own cousins. And the savage irony of this, I'm afraid, 
is that his first cousin, Leonard Messel, was a colonel in the army at that time. So you can see the sort of horrible family tensions that were there. But it's really with this generation, this second generation of German Jews living in Britain, that we begin to see that shift in the identity coming through. And this is particularly because Leonard Messel would no longer really have seen himself as British in his nationality, but for him, he was very much English. And I think it's worth our just reflecting on the difference between those two identities. The concept of being British is a very shallow identity, only with roots back to the 18th century, the creation of Britain at the beginning of the 18th century. It means it's a much more inclusive, a much broader identity, but ultimately it's really just a passport, what perhaps in, in German you would call a Staatsangehörigkeit, you know, a state affiliation. Whereas being English is something which goes back over a thousand years, has much deeper roots and much deeper resonances. And it's the sort of thing which Ludwig Messel, the first generation, would never have been able to appropriate or even claim that he had a case to. He spoke English with a very pronounced German accent. He was clearly from a very different cultural background. Leonard Messel, on the other hand, born in England, went to Eton, went to Oxford, had 20 years as a volunteer in the Territorial Army, was awarded the OBE for his war service, um, member of several London clubs. He was lieutenant of the City of London. And indeed, he actually became the High Sheriff of Sussex in the 1930s. So he was a real pillar of English society. He was when you can see that real shift from German Jewry into English gentry. And for him, having inherited the very Teutonic looking Nymans with its new extension, he desperately wanted to move beyond that identity. So he and his wife, Maud, throughout, sorry, that's with him um, as he looked in, in later life. He and his wife, Maud, during the 1920s, undertook this massive redesign of Nymans from that Germanic Teutonic looking extension into a completely new creation, which was this faux manor house, a medieval manor house created from nothing in the 1920s. And this is indeed the same building which we see today in its ruined form as the National Trust property down in West Sussex um, as a result of the 1947 fire which destroyed most of the main rooms in the house. We've got some photographs, however, of how it looked in the 1930s thanks to a Country Life series. And you can see here from the interior, it was presented in the way, the manner of, a, of an English country house which had been added to and developed over centuries of accretion. So you have different elements in it. The large um, painting by Bonifacio Veronese over the open door, next to it on the right, a Flemish tapestry, very uncomfortable Stuart furniture from the 17th century, which looked great, but apparently it was absolutely awful to sit on. And then on the right hand wall, these um, 17th century portraits, which were one of the um, key fascinations for Leonard Messel as a collector, and give you a couple of examples of the sorts of works he bought. This rather nice portrait of um, James the Second Marquis of Hamilton by the Anglo Dutch painter Daniel Meitens, and a portrait of Dame Rebecca Pye by a follower of Van Dyck, which indeed has just been bought back by the National Trust and will be going on display at Nyman's soon. But really for Leonard Messel, the building which he had inherited from his father was expressed in the extraordinary collections that he formed, firstly of botanical books. He had this unparalleled library. Apparently there was actually one in the country which could, could be, be compared with his, and that was the library of the Royal Horticultural Society itself. Uh, a botanical library of incunabula and rare books going back to the 15th century, all of which perished um, in the fire of 1947, I'm afraid, except for the one volume which survived, which was the 1542 edition of Leonard Fuchs's De Historia Stipium. You can see the page here open at the poppy 
um, to give a sense of just how marvelous how, um, these books would have been. And Leonard Messel threw himself in to collecting and the serious business of understanding the collections he has, including the pot plant collections themselves. And with those plant collections, this is a Eucryphia, um, which is a particular um, favorite at Nyman's, Eucryphia Nyman's ensis. It flowers very well in the late summer, if you have any need for that in your garden. And, and, and with this, he developed his link to lots of associations and organizations, which again enabled him to integrate into British society, into English society. So he became a member of the Council of the Royal Horticultural Society. He joined the Linnaean Society. He also became a member of the Exclusive Garden Society, which was an invitation only, male only club of garden owners of the time. He became a member of the British Fine Arts Club. He was a, a, a very avid Freemason and church warden of his local church for over 30 years. But perhaps most um, famously, it was his collection of ornamental fans, which he developed over many, many years and which are now in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge as a complete collection there. So this again propels him into the upper echelons of society. He became um, the master of the worshipful company of fan makers, which is one of the city, city liveries, and indeed became a personal friend of Queen Mary at the time, who was also another of the most enthusiastic fan collectors. When Leonard Messel died, his obituary referred to him quite simply as a fine old English gentleman, with absolutely no consideration to the fact that he was a second generation immigrant or anything like that. And I think that that transition, that very swift transition to being an English gentleman is characteristic of a lot of the families I've been looking at. And he put that down, or he, he, he transmitted that to his, his children. Anne Messel, who was one of the bright young things of the interwar years, was regularly described in the society weeklies as one of the great English beauties, the most beautiful woman in London, quote unquote. But she also had this strong understanding of the importance of, of, of culture, of the preservation of culture, she founded the Victorian Society at some um, 18 Stafford Terrace, which remains today as a museum, a, a time capsule of the 1890s. Her brother, Oliver Messel, similarly one of the great socialites of the interwar years, um, and also the greatest stage designer in Britain in the 20th century, when at the end of the Second World War, the Royal Opera House was reopened, it was Oliver Messel who was given the task of designing the set and the costumes for the production of the Sleeping Beauty, which reopened it. And indeed, that production has been revived again and again and again. In fact, just for the first six months of this year, as you can see on the right, the Messel production of the Sleeping Beauty has been put on at Covent Garden. But similarly, when it came to 1953, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, it was Oliver Messel who was asked to deck out the royal box with all of its finery to, to, to celebrate that, and also to transform the front of the Dorchester Hotel into a new extravaganza of, as if it were, theatrical boxes. And what's interesting about this photograph is that, as well as it being in 1953, 70 years later, this year, the Dorchester has restaged the Oliver Messel facade for the coronation of King Charles III. And this has been up for the last two months in Park Lane at the Dorchester Hotel. I think it's only just recently been taken down. But it's with Tony Armstrong Jones and Messel's son that we come full circle in the story. And he was himself a very... Um, well-respected photographer in the post-war years, but really won international fame in 1960 when he married the Queen's sister, Princess Margaret. And this wonderful um, family wedding photograph, which you see here, um, looking from the left of the people standing behind, you have Anne Messel in the most magnificent hat, um, next to the current King, Charles III, and the former Queen, Elizabeth, and then Tony Armstrong Jones 
next to her with then of course Princess Margaret, Prince Philip, um, the Queen Mother and Ronald Armstrong Jones as well. And, and it's an extraordinary image, I think, of social mobility when you think that the German Jewish immigrants within a couple of generations had actually made it into the very, very highest echelon of society by marrying into the royal family. And I love to think to myself how on earth it would have felt if you'd said to those first Messels as they were tramping as refugees down from Bentheim to the village of Messel, that they would actually 200 years later be marrying into the same British royal family who just kicked them out of their home, what on earth would they have thought at that time? Now, I want to just, oh, and, and indeed, I mean, more than that, that their, their son, the first son of um, Tony Armstrong Jones and Princess Margaret was born fifth in line to the throne. I mean, an extraordinary tale of social mobility. But I want to just finish by saying that isn't the only model which is available. You know, I, this, is a, this is a tale of radical assimilation where the family basically moved away from its Jewish identity and its German identity. It didn't have to be like that. And their cousins, Isaac and Lena Seligman, who you can see here in a photograph from the Richard Levy archive, um, they remained Jewish. And many of the Seligman family remained Jewish um, through the years and indeed up till now, so that when the Messel family left Nyman's, their country house in West Sussex, to the National Trust as a national bequest, the Seligman family left their family home, their country house of Shoyswell in East Sussex, to as a Jewish convalescent home. They left it to the order of Ache Brit. So it shows that the radical assimilation of, of, of jettisoning your Jewish identity is, is only one particular model and that there were others which were shown at the same time. But I will say that looking across the full range of the 12 families which I'm currently researching who had these magnificent art collections in Britain in the late 19th, early 20th century, looking across them, the majority did actually tend towards this radical assimilation and that within a couple of generations they had lost a lot of their Jewish identity and particularly just to, to give you an, an idea of it with these 12 families in the second generation there were 31 marriages 31 weddings of their children of those 31 marriages not a single one was between two Jews and not in church so it shows you that trajectory of marrying out or marrying away from the original faith. But I think the final, final thing I would like to just reflect on is that while it didn't really matter so much if you came with an intention of jettisoning your Jewish identity or it just happened because you drifted away from it or whether you stayed within the Jewish community here, these families, these German Jewish migrants to Britain, made an extraordinary contribution across a completely enormous set of fields. And that indeed was exactly the conclusion made in the um, second chance book published by the Leobic Institute um, back in, in, in 1991. And I think what's fascinating for me is that that, that build up, that sense of cultural sophistication which allowed them to make those contributions is seen in the artistic sphere as well as in their professional sphere. The Second Chance book, the, the essays in it really dealt with their professional lives and their professional contribution. My research is looking almost in parallel at the cultural and artistic contribution that they made. And some of those contributions are visible. You can see here perhaps the most obvious one which is the Mond Room in the National Gallery here in London, which commemorates the extraordinary gift given by Ludwig Mond in 1909 of 43 old master paintings. I don't think it actually um, has the Stubbs whistle jacket there at the moment. This is a picture which is really just to show you that the Mond Room and the Mond identity is still front and centre. But also the BBC proms, which are 
starting in two weeks' time. The Royal Opera House, the Whitechapel Art Gallery, the Art Fund, all of these key cultural institutions owe a large part of their success and their continuing existence to the German Jewish support in those early years. And so that really brings me to this sort of concluding thought that Bildung, as they had learnt it as a principle, an ideal of self-cultivation, was not just a private matter. It wasn't just a personal ideal which you should follow in your own life. It was also seen as part of a civic duty that your development of your personal artistic expression should also be seen as contributing to the broader social advancement and a broader understanding and a, and a raising of all boats, if you wish. And I think that that is what's given us the legacy of the German Jewish contribution that we can enjoy to this day, um, even if you can't actually read the German Jewish identity, unless you look under the surface. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, John, for your remarkable for inspiring talk. Um, we are now going to open the floor for the Q and A. And um, everyone who's participating online can put their name into the chat and we can um, call upon you in the order of appearance, as I may say. And everyone in the room is of course also welcome to ask questions. So um, anybody with questions to John Hillary tonight about his talk. So we have Mr. Mark Zeligman um, online can ask to unmute. Does it work? I think you have, you have to ask. Oh, to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Just. Yes. Can, can you can you try to unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Would you mind writing your your question? Yes, I think that's worked. Now someone's put a box up that's very helpful i think you can hear me now uh i thank you john that was an amazing story and i really enjoyed it i was just going to make a comment about um isaac seligman who you showed who married Lena messel which is that the seligmans had originally come from bavaria uh, some 30 years earlier but they hadn't come to britain they'd gone to america all eight brothers and then two of them, Isaac and my great grandfather, came to England and they in turn brought the Messels, as you said, to England. So the assimilation process for them was even more complex because they arrived in Britain as Yankee Jewish bankers. So they were regarded as Yankees, not, not German. Uh, and perhaps that is why they went down a slightly different route from uh, the Messels. But, as a question, I might ask you, what do you think about that? Is there anything relevant in the American aspect? I, I think that's absolutely right, Mark. And, and it's actually very interesting to me that they picked up that confidence and that much stronger belief in keeping the Jewish identity, I think, because they'd had that time in 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 um the american system and there's a wonderful book for people who don't know which tells the story of the seligman family called our crowd written by stephen birmingham um and and that really gives you a sense of the cultural confidence that the jewish community in new york at that time had which i think um isaac brought with him over here what i should also have said i think is that this trend amongst German Jews who came directly from Germany towards radical assimilation and shedding their Jewish identity was very different from the Anglo-Jewish experience. Um, the writing of Todd Endelman in particular, but others who've studied this, um, makes a very clear differentiation between the small number, relatively small number of Anglo-Jews who converted or drifted away from Judaism 
and the much larger proportion of German Jews who came over and did the same thing, to the extent, in fact, that there were regular criticisms of the German Jews from within the Anglo-Jewish community saying that the German Jews simply weren't pulling their weight. They weren't joining synagogues, they weren't joining the communal institutions in the same way. So I think you're absolutely right that that, that exposure to a more confident scenario in New York is what may well have given the Seligman family a much greater desire to stay within um, the, the Jewish community here. Thank you. Do we have any more? Oh, yes, sorry. Are you sure it's all fabulous? Sorry. Um, I was wondering about the absence of the Rothschild family uh, and also noting that the Rothschilds, whilst not necessarily being practicing Jews, nonetheless, for the first couple of generations, tend to marry within the family and have kept a very strong link towards uh, Zionism and Israel. Yes. And um, if I go back to the list, um, you can't quite see the two at the bottom if you're in the room, um, which is the Michaelis and Stern families. But you're absolutely right. I had... There's two reasons, really, why I wasn't going to be focusing on the Rothschilds in my current research. One is that they've been wonderfully well covered already, and I don't think I could add anything to the works which have been written on their art collections up until now. But also that in the English context, they'd come quite a lot earlier. Um, Nathan Meyer Rothschild had obviously come at the end of the 18th century, starting in Manchester and then moving to London from there. So that by the end of the 19th century, the English Rothschilds, as they were known, were central pillars of Anglo Jewry. So in a sense, they'd made the transition from German Jews to Anglo Jews, British Jews, by that time. And I think, again, as you say, it's, it's, it's very interesting how they married, firstly, within the broader Rothschild family itself, and then within the broader cousinhood of the Anglo Jewish elite here, because what's fascinating about the later German Jewish arrivals is that they really didn't. I've been very surprised about how separate they kept themselves from the Anglo Jewish community. I mean, for example, with Sir Otto Beit at the top, there is a wonderful historical record in the archive for the Beit family which shows the dinner parties that he and his wife held in their Belgravia home in Belgrave Square. And there are lots and lots of, of, of German Jews who'd come over with them and also been involved in the South African adventures. There are lots of high artistic cultural individuals and there are members of high society in Britain. But there's almost no mention of any Rothschild that I could see or indeed any of the other families, the Montefiores, the Samuels, the Montagues, Makatas, Lusadas, they, they just aren't there. So this separate life really which the later German Jews held um, is something which I really want to try and bring out in, in, in my research because that keeps them quite separate from the Rothschilds, except for their business dealings. So L. Messel and Co., Ludwig Messel, he became a stockbroker to the Rothschilds, and they had lots of business dealings together. Um, but there doesn't really seem to have been a social mixing at all, which I found, I found surprising. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that you said just now that they, uh, that you found that, or that you were surprised by the way in, in which many of these people shed their Jewish identity very soon after uh, arriving in, in Britain, whereas the, in inverted commas, native Jewish uh, community, Anglo-Jewish community um, did not. Um, I want to make two observations on that. First, I think that may be something to do with the fact uh, that um, the German Jewish community by the time they came to England were far more secularized than, than uh, English, uh, English, Jews, um, English Jews were. And the second uh, observation is while they shed their Jewish identity fairly quickly, they did not, by and large, uh, 
shed their German identity as quickly as they got rid of their, of their Jewish identity. And in that context, I wanted to ask a question <coughs> uh, regarding the uh, Messel family. Um, I haven't come, I mean, I, I'm a bit familiar with this field, and um, the prominence of the German Jewish um, characters in the German cultural institutions in London is very pronounced, but I have not come across a, 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 a Messel there. Whereas if you take the Mont, Kassel, Speyer, um, they were at the forefront. The, the German Athenaeum, mm -hmm. the, um, the English Goethe Society is a Jewish, yes, exactly. German Jewish creation, uh, the Kaiserspende, yeah. which caused them a lot of trouble when, when they all donated this money in 1913 for the 25th anniversary of the of William II coming to the throne. So um, is the case of the Messel a, a bit um, different in that they um, not only got rid of their Jewish identity, but also with the exception of the father whom you mentioned, um, their, their German identity as well. Mm. Whereas, whereas many of the others, and, and I could talk about the other names you have in your family, uh, in, your, in your list there as well. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I won't go on. No, no, I, I think it's a, very, it's a very good question. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, people like um, Frieda Mond, particularly um, the, the wife of Ludwig Mond, who was this great intellectual force in the English Goethe Society. Karl Mayer was the treasurer of the German Athenaeum for many, many years. You're absolutely right. They were front and center. I don't think Ludwig Messel kept as much of his public German persona. But we know, for example, that the, the books he had in his library were all the classic Goethe, Schiller, Herder books, which everybody would have had at that time. They spoke German in the Messel household, even though the mother was English. Um, they would speak German amongst the ones who could speak German, and they were all taught in that second generation to be able to speak German. And indeed, to the next generation, my grandmother was taught by a German governess up to the, the, the First World War. So I think you're absolutely right that there, there wasn't a public expression, perhaps, of the German identity, um, except, of course, the interesting thing that they kept the name of Messel. So while a lot of families, Jewish and non-Jewish, were either completely dropping their name or anglicizing it into a more acceptable version, perhaps, especially in the First World War, the Messels never did that. Now, it's not it's not Saxe Coburg Goethe, it's not Battenberg, it's you know, you're absolutely right. But it was interesting for Oliver Messel when he was at school, right. when his school fellows, his fellow pupils, found out that Messel was a German name. He was bullied dramatically as a result of that. So I think you're right. I mean, it's much less of an, a, 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 of an evidence that Ludwig wanted to keep a German identity there. At the same time, he did continue to maintain his links with Darmstadt even after Alfred Messel had died. Um, Ludwig Messel and his other brother, Rudolf, who'd come over here, they put up the funding for the two giant brass lions, bronze lions, outside the um, Hessisches Landesmuseum. And it's really nice sometimes when you, you meet people from Darmstadt who in their childhood days would all climb up onto these lions and sit there after school and you say, aha, these lions were donated by my great-great-grandfather. Um, so they kept the connections going, but I don't think they had the cultural identity in the same way. So I think you're probably right in that respect. Yes, we've got Christina, but we have one question online, and then Christina and then in the back. Okay, so let's start with um, John Coleman first, who's online. Um... Hello. I don't know if you can see me or hear me. <laughs> Hang on a second. Um... We, we, we can hear your question. Ah. Great. Uh, no, simply, um, you touched on it before with uh, the Saxe Coburg and Mountbatten point. Was there something specific about the 1850s and the British attitude, well, the English attitude to Germany that would have given that wave of migrants an easy ride? Uh, would, they, would they have been seen? I mean, obviously, we forget how welcome Germans were at the time. Was there, was there a particularly easy ride because of it? Were other Germans equally welcomed? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's, a, again, a very good question. And in the 19th century, the relationship between Germany and Britain was obviously infinitely closer and better than it became as it launched into the 20th century and slid towards the First World War. And I think for a lot of the German Jews who came over, and people like Sir Ernest Castle, Sir Edgar Speyer, um, they were horrified at the prospect that their two countries, their native country and their adopted country, could be slipping towards war because they'd had absolutely no inkling of that in the 1860s, 1870s, and the 1880s, because of course, traditionally, the, the, the Germans had been seen as our allies against the French, who had been our traditional enemies for centuries and centuries. Um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. They wouldn't have felt that there was as much of a threat to them with a German identity. Similarly, actually, at the time, um, for a Jewish identity, it's been fascinating seeing how German Jews perceived the situation for Jews in England at that time. And sometimes I think it's over exaggerated. You get statements from German Jews who come over to Britain and they say this is a, a paradise for Jews and others would sort of set them right that it wasn't quite such a paradise. But certainly that that comparison, I think, for Germans as Germans and German Jews as German Jews was something which was reiterated again and again and again. And you have these um, fascinating testimonies in the memoirs of people like Sir Felix Simon, who was the laryngologist who became the physician to Edward VII himself. He was offered a post back in Berlin as he became more and more well known. And he just said, we don't want to go back there. We remember that caste hatred and we just feel happy in the life that we've been able to create for ourselves here in London um, and he later on in the first world war wrote incredibly movingly about this 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 profound anxiety he had found himself as a German living in Britain when the country had turned against him thank you so much this was really fascinating. Um, I have a question about economic assets, um, because these 12 families that you are looking at, they are all well off, um, but there are differences in magnitude. I mean, Castle was absolutely fabulously rich. I imagine much richer than the Messels, for example. Um, so is there a difference because you mentioned yourself the the argument of Simone Lessig that economic capital can be transferred into social capital and maybe this it is even easier and faster if, you know the, the richer you are or do you just need um, to cross a certain threshold of um, asset and then you will be able to integrate that quickly. So, so how important is money really in the grand scheme of things and how much money do you need to have for that? Yes, I think that, that's fascinating as, a, as, as an idea. I mean, looking down the list here, um, Alfred Byte was the richest man in the world at that time. The Bishopsheim, spectacularly rich, Castle Hirsch, Hirsch less so perhaps, and the Myers less so. Um, uh, and what's interesting particularly is the two names of Henry Oppenheimer and the brothers Max and Morris Rosenheim, um, because they weren't necessarily of that same super rich elite. And the Rosenheim brothers are, are an interesting example, which I've, I've been very um, fascinated to explore because they show a slightly different take on this. They, of all of these groups, they were the only ones in trade. They were wine merchants and their translation of what less economic capital they had into social capital came via a much deeper engagement with art. So they actually put more cultural capital in. Um, they would write papers in academic um, magazines, journals about art collecting and about art history. They were very prominent in the Society of Antiquaries and the British Museum. So they were much more hands-on than the other ones. And maybe that's the distinction. Um, for Sir Ernest Castle, he was busy running much of, of, of Europe and North Africa for much of this time. He didn't have a huge amount of um, spare time to spend 
on collecting art and other things, even though he did. Um, whereas the Rosenheims and Henry Oppenheim were, were perhaps more hands-on, as indeed was um, Leopold Hirsch, who seems to have been personally very um, excited about going to the art dealers and discussing with them what was coming onto the market, what had just been sold, what might be a new discovery in the field. So maybe that's the distinction. The ones who are wealthy can just pay for it to happen. The ones who are less wealthy have to put a bit more effort in um, to engage in, in that way. Was there a couple more down there? I think the gentleman in the light, lighter blue shirt had it first, but the... Well, thank you very much for your talk. It's all completely new to me. I, I knew practically nothing about this um, strata of German Jews in, in this country in the 19th century. What I was wondering about when you were talking about how they were received by Anglo-Jewish families who had been established in Britain, was what were their relations... I'm sorry if I missed this and you mentioned this. What were the relationships with established wealthy Sephardi families? given that they had different synagogues, different institutions, apart from perhaps the West London Synagogue, which was set up originally to be a kind of a, uh, a coming together of British Jews. But did they yes. marry? Did they socialise together? Did they collaborate on cultural works? Yeah, it's very interesting because the, the, the West London Synagogue, by and large, is what attracted pretty much all of the families who remained within the Jewish community at all in that first generation and, and, and certainly having looked at the records of the West London Synagogue over in the London Metropolitan Archive it's all of these families who come up um, apart from the ones who haven't gone so for them I think it was less of the division between Ashkenazi and Sephardi it was much more of the social understanding of you know do you want to be part of a reform Judaism which of course for them coming from the German context had by that period become really the dominant model. I mean, for the Messels in particular, when they were in Darmstadt, um, orthodox Judaism was, was reduced to a small rump. And in fact, it was only in the 1870s, 1880s, that there was a reaction, and that the, the orthodox Jewish families, particularly who were migrating into Darmstadt from the countryside, they formed a sort of resistance to try to pull back the, the the reform Jews from the Haskalah and, and 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 to get a little bit more of a balance there. So I think in 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 the German Jews who came into Britain, yes, it was very much the reform Judaism that they migrated towards. Um, but really, you know, within that one generation, the membership of synagogues seems to drop off entirely, and it's only really sort of rather different. Um, responses like in the second generation Sir Alfred Mond, who was brought up entirely in a secular home in, in Cheshire, not circumcised, not given any sense that he was Jewish, he then reclaimed his Jewish identity sort of one generation back and became very, very involved in, in Palestine and setting up Jewish communities there. So it's very strange. You can't predict it, but it sort of happens in, in those weird ways. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, and um, yeah, so if I understand you correctly, it was we, it was about like um, belonging and identity and how it expressed itself in art, literature, uh, architecture. And I was wondering how explicit this this connection really was. Like, have you found sources in which your protagonists really reflected on themselves, and uh, did they? For example, redevelop the house on purpose, like to fit in, was it something they thought about? I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. It's a very, it's a very pertinent question. Um, but it's hard because there are not really any archival sources where you hear them speaking about that sort of thing. Um, but what is interesting, I think, is that they were not aping, copying the tradition that had established itself in 19th century Britain. So the mainstream tradition of art collecting and presentation of identity had shifted from the old model of high culture and old masters into a much more modern expression, a modern idiom, 
whereby most new collectors in the 19th century would be collecting 19th century British art. You think about the new wealth coming in for Henry Tate, for example, or um, the, the, the Lever um, family up in, in the Wirral, or indeed Thomas Holloway here. They all collected 19th century British art as a statement of identity, which was very different from that of the aristocratic collectors of the 18th century. In come the German Jews with a completely different cultural identity and a different desire to express their building at a much higher, more universalist European level. And I think that they aspired to the high culture of the Renaissance, of the Enlightenment, in a way which was very different from that of the British collectors at the time. And in fact, my research is trying to really draw out to what extent their engagement in the art market actually revitalized interest in the old masters, which had dropped to an extraordinary level. I mean, one of the most wonderful statistics I, I, I found in another study is that in the 1850s in Britain, when a landseer or a work by William Powell Frith would cost you between five and ten thousand pounds, you could get a Rubens for 300. <laughs> And that shift in the market, whereby, you know, modern was great and these old fuddy-duddy ones were hopeless, it took another 50 or 60 years to come round. And then, of course, you get the American buyers coming in and the, the market just completely takes off in the other direction. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's hard to be able to say that, you know, I have put all these things on my wall in order to show that honorific consumption, to show that I am a person of superior building. In a way, if you ever said that, it would undermine your case. You had to do it without saying. And in fact, all of the work of Pierre Bourdieu, looking at the transference of, of, of economic capital to social capital says, you must do it without speaking about it. It must be silent to work. Thank you. Um, I don't want to be frivolous, um, but I have a, two reflections. One is, my name is Massil, M-A-S-S-I-L, and my grandparents came from Belarus and Ukraine and were wood turners. Oh. Not even Germans. Um, but you, because you mentioned that Oliver, when it was discovered at school that he was German, Nothing to do with the sense of the muscle. I mean, I at school, I had no trouble being called muscle, but they didn't know where it came from. Nobody knew where it came from. Um, so I just, I just mentioned that. Thank you. Uh, we're not connected in any way at all. Um, but the other thing, you also, you get to the First World War and the discomfiture of the German Jews or any German. Um, this is the, the, the further thing I want to say is it reflects also on the Rothschild situation. Um, do, does your book have any sense of the 1930s and appeasement and who would dine with Nazi uh, actors, as it were? There's a very curious story of the Duchess of Roxburgh. Um, who was at a dinner in July 1938. Everybody knows that Ribbentrop had been ambassador from Germany, but that in April he was recalled to Berlin and a new man became ambassador. And he obviously did his homework and he arranged concerts and invited people and got in with the Liverpools and others who were known uh, sympathisers. Um, so he takes him to dinner at this meal, um, the Duchess of Roxburgh, and he's done some homework and he knows she has Scottish ancestry. Dutch. He, he knows that Roxburgh is Scottish. So he says to her um, that did she get her fine eyes from her Scottish ancestry. 
And she says, oh, no, no, um, I'm, my grandfather was a Rothschild. And the company knew exactly that he was, you know, what was going on. Did any of these people mingle with the, the appeasers? I put it crudely. Well, I think it, that's, I mean, I haven't really gone that far into the 1930s. I very deliberately stopped um, before that, because I think there are people who are much better placed um, than I am to be able to, 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 to look into that. But I am very aware um, of the amount of more than just appeasers, as you said yourself, sympathizers from the English aristocracy who do end up going into Germany and expressing um, virulently pro-Nazi um, sentiments at that time. And what is, I think, very awkward, particularly for some of the families who actually had German-Jewish roots, is where you find two or three generations down that because they've been very successful, they've also found themselves in that English aristocratic milieu with sympathy for the social and economic program of the 1930s in Germany. And I think um, that that certainly is something I've come across, um, but it's not something which I'm I'm investigating. My, my research finishes really in the First World War. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. It's an extraordinary part of the story. And, I, and that, that degree of English aristocratic sympathy for the program of, of 1930s Germany, I don't think has really been brought out enough. I mean, I think everyone focuses on Edward VIII and his, his sort of much more well-known um, support for the Nazi regime, but much less has been done to look beyond the Mitfords, for example, as to how, how, how widely um, that was shared. Are there any more questions in the room other than mine? Okay, so I just... Could you talk a little bit about their relationship with the, you know, large Jewish um, immigration coming from the east in the yes. sort of 1880s, 1890s, and, you know, obviously much more Jewish and obviously much poorer as well? Yes, absolutely. And um, that um, much greater wave of immigration from um, fleeing the pogroms from 1881 onwards was a massive challenge to the Jewish community in, in Britain. And I think what most people have done is looked at the response of the established Anglo-Jewish elite to it, which was an ambivalent response. I mean, originally there was quite a resistance to the idea of welcoming in these refugees precisely because it was fear that they might upset the balance and the, and the gains already made by Anglo Jewry in the 19th century. And then gradually that was shifted and you saw much more of an interventionist and supportive response from the Anglo Jewish elite. Bizarrely, you don't see quite so much from these new newcomers. I mean, I think because the German Jews themselves were a little bit outside the establishments of the Anglo-Jewish institutions, like, for example, the Board of Deputies. You don't really see any of these names appearing in the Board of Deputies. The Anglo-Jewish Association, which was the body which was supposed to engage in, in the support for Jewish communities outside Britain, except for Isaac Seligman, who was very, very um, prominent in it, and Ludwig Messel, who joined it, but then didn't really have much to do with it. Um, there seems to have been no active support. The one thing I will say is when you see the published lists of donations to the funds in support of Russian Jews, as it was always called, um, the German Jewish migrants are right at the top giving financially so there's a very strong sense of being financially engaged in supporting the refugees and and, and the funds for them but again it's hard to know to what extent that it was actually just sort of um paying lip service to it because they knew that it was something which was coming out and and i find it absolutely fascinating to sort of navigate as to what was actually going on there. I mean, 
Alfred Beit at the top brought up entirely without any Jewish uh, background or any real sort of sense of being in a Jewish community, he paid for new synagogues in Hackney and Wolverhampton. And you think, well, that's very strange, because of all the people on the list, you just thought he'd be the least likely to do that. So it comes in unexpected ways, but I don't think that they were engaged in the support for these newcomers in the same way. Um, the only interesting, perhaps, other sort of variant of that is that presence in Whitechapel of the Whitechapel Art Gallery. And bizarrely, that actually was sustained largely by German Jewish finances. So Edgar Speyer was the number one um, financer after Passmore Edwards, who'd been the first sort of um, financial support for it. And he then got other German Jews, Beit, Messel and the others um, to support it. But that was a cultural presence within Whitechapel, which is, of course, where all of the um, Eastern European Jews migrated and settled. So it's a, it's a difficult one to be able to answer, but they certainly weren't at the forefront of that reception, I think. Okay, so um, thank you, John. If I may, I have one question before we can move to a wine reception and, and keep discussing this fascinating topic. I was wondering, just to come back to my introduction, whether you would say that um, the appreciation of Bildung amongst German Jewry in the 19th century is the import product into Britain that you see within this family, within these families that has persisted the longest um, amongst everything that they brought with them. I think so, and I think I think that's absolutely right to identify it as being such an integral part of the German Jewish identity in that period of emancipation and afterwards. And so many of the studies have, have, have reiterated this, that as German Jews became much more secular, Bildung almost replaced Judaism as their new religion. It was new in their identity. And it was because that's how they would show themselves, not just to be German, but to be high class, uh, uh, elite in the society. And it's fascinating then, if you look a hundred years on, um, the, the, the book called The Club, which was a, a survey of, of British Jews in the 1980s, I think, asked questions to lots of them saying, you know, how do you understand your Jewishness? And Eva Figgis, the feminist author who was born in Berlin, a refugee from the 1930s, she responded, for me, my Jewishness is nothing to do with the religious heritage or anything like that. It is the intellectual inheritance. It is that cultural, intellectual inheritance which comes directly from Bildung, as far as I see it. And you bump into this again and again and again with so many of the stories of German Jeff Jewish refugees who came over before and indeed from the 1930s and right the way into the 1980s. Whenever you have those interviews with them, even the ones who want nothing to do with Germany and repudiate any sense of wanting to have any contact with Germany, they still retain that belief in high German culture and they still believe about that, that imperative to improve themselves, to cultivate their own sensibilities into the next generation. So I think you're absolutely right. That seems to have a central role, not just in the first generation of migrants, but all the way through and up until now. Okay, so um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And of course, thank you, John, for your for your interesting and very stimulating talk. As we can see, looking at the clock, we had a very long discussion. Um, so before we move to a wine reception, I just would like to say thank you again, of course, to the German Historical Institute, to Christina and her team for hosting us tonight, but also to the Leo Beck Institute's team behind the scenes, Karina Chitayat, who um, tirelessly promoted the event, organized everything surrounding it, and that's something that we sometimes don't see on the forefront, but that is the crucial work to make an evening like that happen, to Clara Cosa, our volunteer, who's always kind of having our backs with Techno technical issues and anything that comes with organization. And of course, to Roke Bar, who is um, not here because she has to look after her children tonight, who does all the social media for us and the promotion of the event. And to the um, 
Oxford University's Country Houses project, of course, also to endorse this evening and to promote it for us. So thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And there's going to be wine and um, hopefully very stimulating conversations in the room next door. Thank you.